Hey everyone, welcome back for another episode of... I Like Conversation. Nailed it. And this is episode... I think it's 26. Or 27. One either one. It's like, we're going pretty deep. And this episode, I'm catching up with a guy, a dad who's in the Built for Adventure program. And I've been working with him for a while, Simon Lewis. He's a physio from Ballarat in Victoria. And we talked about his journey from going to university, becoming a teacher, leaving teaching, becoming a pastor, which is like a priest, but not really. And then going back to uni to do physio, went back to teaching for a little bit, back to physio, and now yeah, and doing a side hustle and all the things that happened along the way. Like it was a really good conversation and the biggest part about the conversation was talking about pain, how pain works, what you can do to overcome pain and get back to the life you want to have. That sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And what are we up to this afternoon? Where are we going? To Risky Kids. Risky Kids! Woo! Want to say goodbye? Bye! Bye! -bye. Simon, Lewis and Simon and I have been working together for a while now. We are working together in SOC for your online business and then we started working together in pretty much what it is now, which is Built for Adventure, which is the dad program I've got going. So it's been a while and I wanted to have him come on today to share some of the cool stuff he's been working on and talking about and what he does. But first up, do you want to tell him a little bit about you, where you are in the world, or what it is that you do and... <laughs> A little bit about your past. Oh man, how long do we have? Um, so I live in Ballarat, down in Victoria, in Australia. Yeah, and I'm a physiotherapist here working at Ballarat OSM, so orthopedic sports medicine, with uh, the, some of the orthopedic surgeons in our sports positions, yeah, which is a very cool place to work uh, out of. I've previously worked in multiple other clinics. I've been a, a secondary school teacher. I've been a personal trainer. I've been a youth pastor. I've been a musician. I've, been, I've done a lot. Um, my wife was congratulating me. Actually, no, I think she was a bit sad, but <laughs> um, congratulating versus like, like it's a bit ridiculous that I've, I've just celebrated almost two years in my current role. And that's the longest I've ever been in a full-time position. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, that's been cool. So you touched on the, the teacher, the teacher yep. part, bit and the pastor stuff, which I would say is two things at the same time then. What was first? Was being a pastor first? Uh, in between, actually. Like, so, oh, yeah, right. So uh, you start with the teacher's thing then. That'd be cool. So I, I did my personal training course out of year 12. So I did mm. finish year 12, went straight into my personal training course and then straight into the uni. That was my, that was my, like, my, uh, my, um, what the, what, school is, school is, I did study instead. Um, <laughs> and, and from there I did, yeah, some personal training and then went into doing my teaching degree. And so I moved out this part of Victoria because I grew up in Melbourne, grew up in this part of Victoria, um, to come and teach at Stall Secondary College. So that's mm. where I was teaching and I did 18 months there and burnt out for the first time and then switched back to doing some PT because I was now an hour right and it was at that point that my wife and I had just started the youth group at the church there uh, and so then they asked well if you're not teaching would you like to come come on board and do some youth pastoring and get paid to do the same thing that I was doing so I did that for I think it was a year 18 months built it up from two kids up to about I think we had 15 by the time we finished. Nice. Um, and then I went and did my um, physio course in Ballarat. And so we moved to Ballarat and did that from there. Um, but I, I did get suckered back into teaching. So I did another year here in Ballarat. <laughs> that was two years ago I did that uh, just as a one-off year and then back to physio again. So I sort of changed a bit between it all. You mentioned the burnout part. Yeah. What? kind of led to the burnout with teaching i could imagine what kind of yeah and then what made you realize it was burnout what led to the burnout was um me overcooking everything like wanting to make mm. sure i'm doing a really good job and essentially having senior colleagues who really there, collect their paycheck, do the minimum, you're about to retire. 
they've seen it all, they've done it all, they don't want to borrow it and they just want to keep going. And that was really frustrating. And it meant that I picked up the slack. Uh, and I probably, I probably did too much. Like I, then the, the, the term before I fully burnt out, I was head of sports. So I was running all the sports carnivals and sporting events. I completely redesigned the year nine curriculum. I built a casino simulator from scratch in Excel because I thought that was cool. Um, <laughs> probably didn't need to do that. Like, so I overcooked a little bit in there. So <laughs> definitely on me, but there was a, yeah, a bit of an environmental thing in terms of um, some other teachers and that, that uh, culture of not really wanting to do too much change. Change being really, really hard and me wanting to make change really quickly and really um, aggressively. Uh, which is something that I've had a pattern that I found when I move and have had to learn to to change slower and to bring people on with it. Um, so that that was that was what led to it. What I noticed, um, just zero margin for anything. Uh, and I had no capacity to deal with uh, student behavior anymore. Like I would mm, blow up for reals. Yeah. Not blow up for like for like the show of behavior management, which there is a tool that you can use, but no, I was blowing up for real on like small things and just not enjoying anything, didn't want to go to work and just absolutely cooked and exhausted. Um, yeah, I had to go to the GP and the GP was like, I think you've got depression because I don't think even burnout was a major like known thing, particularly out yeah. rurally. And uh, no, I still don't talk about that much. Still, don't talk about it. It's like, oh, well, you're, you're, you're feeling down. Yes. You must have depression. I'm like, I don't, I don't know if that's like, I feel that, but I don't know if that's the thing. Um, so I, yeah, carried on for a little bit and then ended up resigning from there and going back to some PT and doing new things and stuff for that. So I had six months off of doing a few other bits before I jumped into physio. So how long were you when you stopped? that first round of teaching and had a little bit of a gap and went into physio. How old was I? Yeah. Or well, before we started physio course. Oh man. Uh, so well, how long have we been now? We've been in Ballarat six years, so seven years now. So I would have been 24, I think. 34 kicking off the physio course. Got to think now. 26, I think, cause I turned 30 when I finished it. Yeah. Right. Because I said, even that, it's like a, something that you don't see often. Once someone does that one course, they'll just figure out a way to make it work. Cause I've done it. I have to make it work. But you pivoted away and went to physio. What attracted you about physio? Well, physio was the thing I originally wanted to do out of school. Uh, back then it was extremely difficult to get into. You needed a 97 mm. ATAR. And there was only like three unis in Victoria that did it. Uh, I got a, I got a fairly high ATO, but not quite high enough, uh, and did get in as a second round up in the Gold Coast, but logistically couldn't get it to work. Mm -hmm. Um, so I always wanted to go in and do that. And obviously being a, I was an athlete growing up in athletics, um, never really had injuries. It's the, the typical physio story is, you know, you got injured and saw physio and this and that. Mm -hmm. I actually hated physio growing up. I had one physio and he was, when I uh, banged my knee and went to a physio and it's like, you have growing pains. And I'm like, have you looked at me? I am, I'm like 160 centimeters. Like I'm, I have not grown. <laughs> I've not grown since like grade six. This is not a thing. So <laughs> I thought physios were idiots until I actually did it. And now I'm a physio. So, um, <laughs> so it wasn't that, uh, but I think it's more the, the, um, uh, the exercise and, um, helping people to get back to those things and to live healthy fully functional lives is, is really where I got to. I like that. And it's kind of, so it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty crazy journey. So did teaching left that, went PC, did pastoring at the same kind of time. Then did, <laughs> then you did your physio course. You went back to teaching. Was that during the course? Like, uh, the I did some, I did some like casual teaching through the course, but no, I mm. did my, I did my first year out at one clinic and then finished there. And I went, now what do I do? And so I went to a, like an in-home clinic bit. And then I went to an interview to one of our local schools here saying, oh, can I get some casual teaching? And they're like, we really need a year seven math teacher. Can you please come? I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I did that at the same time as physio for a year. What was that like? 
going back to teaching? The going same? back to teaching, it was interesting. I had been given two year seven classes and I only had two seven, year seven classes. So I took it as an opportunity to really go make it to revamp the curriculum again, mm-hmm. which is the, my favorite part. And I did, and I got some really good results, but you know, ruffle of feathers in that change process as always. Yeah. Um, no, so no enjoyed emotion, that really. and did it differently. Uh, and would, I was almost thinking like, oh, maybe I'll go into teaching again full time. But I did find trying to do the two really different. Yeah. You can't imagine. Um, my physio was suffering. Like I'd see, like I, cause if I'm doing like a day and a half, I would see like some guy would come in, like, oh, shoulder injury. I'm like, oh, I haven't seen a shoulder for like a month. How do I do it again? Like, what am I going to do? Yeah. Oh. So I just wasn't seeing enough patients to keep the knowledge front of mind to be able to, to do it properly. So I found that difficult. Um, and all my focus and all my, um, time and energy was going into making my mass classes as amazing as possible. Um, which worked, but again, my balance is not great. I was through that time too. You obviously started with family. Oh, my, yeah. We had our first kid second year of my physio degree. So yeah, um, I'm no, no, uh, stranger to burning candles at multiple ends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you do the physio, figuring out your career path that you wanted to do, then did two jobs. Did you have two kids by the time you had the two jobs? Yeah. Yeah. That's nuts. Like even now while we're working with now, like when you were trying to build a, like an online version of your business, you literally just had like another kid. So you've only just had one not long ago either. Yeah. That this and this year when we started working together, that was burnout number two. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that was, yeah, me running my physio clinic. So full time in the physio clinic, trying to get an online coaching side hustle thing going. I was also doing postgrad studies in pain neuroscience. Um, and then we had, yeah, bubba number three come. And that was, that was in the first three months of this year. Yeah. Yeah. Which all at the same time. Wild. Yeah. So I hit Easter and yeah, that was burnout number two and I went, oh uh, yeah. So shut down the online business, pull back on, oh, I'd finished my course luckily, managed to scrape through with that one. And then yeah, started with you going, I just got to get this balance back and just get healthy me before I can do healthy anybody else. Yeah. And it's kind of good. Like it's cool you just said that there's something that I know a lot of mums struggle with this because they have mum kill. So mm. it's a lot of things that it's not talked about as much with dads, but it's still something that's really there. Like see yours is like, you had these big, at the time, the online business, the person stuff, the baby coming, but you also had this idea of wanting to go get this house as well for the family, which put on this like huge amount of stress where you're like, I've got to go do all this shit. I remember when we started working together. There was just a lot of stuff rattling around your head. And then where you are now, where it's like, it's not, we're not going to make say, say sunshine and rainbows. You've got, you still got a baby. The sleep's still shit. Like that's a given. But with all that stress is already there. But the calmness in your thoughts, the way you bring through what messages now seems better. Do you sort of feel the same? Yeah, definitely got like more direction. I guess, and a, 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 a plan, um, and learning to do, to, to pick and choose what I'm working on and realizing earlier when I'm starting to get cooked, like, like we talked about this morning, I mean, um, this week has been every number one of those weeks. I'm like, oh man, I'm just exhausted, starting to feel going on. I'm going, okay, I've just, I've been trying to pick up a few new extra bits and pieces, you know. Pull them back again, go back to looking after me, just have that time and then slowly pull it back up again. Just pick that one thing and work on it rather than getting too, too carried away with all the different things that I'm interested in and want to build it up on. Yeah. And it's like, we were talking about this morning, which we could probably pivot into that now, that concept of how you describe the reservoir and stuff. Do you want to go mm. into that? Sure. Step over what they mean by that. Cause it's just a cool concept. Yeah. So it's, it's a concept that I take through with my patients a lot uh, and I've taken it like the, the stress cups that I know that you've talked mm. about previous episodes 
And I took that concept and I've taken it along with uh, another concept that we've learned in, in our uh, pain neuroscience in terms of pain mechanics and things. And I've taken it on together and, and I talk about it like a, like a, uh, a reservoir and a dam. So think about uh, like your Hugo dams or like a hydroelectric system. And so into the dam, think about that's where all your stresses go. And this is your physical stresses. So like doing your workouts, physical activity, but it's also the workload from your work or uh, home duties, running after kids, cleaning the house, all anything that you do physically that gets added up into the stress reservoir. In addition to that, all the mental tasks also go into there. So if you're having to make decisions, if you're having to, to really process difficult concepts or do the you know, learning, um, study, thinking sort of tasks, uh, like myself as physio, I'm not always doing stacks of physical stuff, but I had to think through, you know, yeah. what's going on with this person? How am I going to diagnose them? How am I going to help them with that? That also goes into the reservoir. At the bottom of the damn wall, we then have the outlet. And I call that the recovery outlet. Mm. And that's things like sleep, your nutrition, specifically your uh, protein intake, but then fruits, veg, hydration, water. Um, and then also your stress management uh, and substance abuse, if that's a thing. Um, sometimes mindset thinking processes can go in there as well. It just depends on the person. So if we then have water in the reservoir from our stress coming in and we have the outlet of recovery that's open and optimal, then the water will come through and it'll come out the outlet and it'll turn the turbine of positive adaptations. Mm. And that can power whatever then the stress was. So if you've been lifting heavy things, you're going to get stronger. If you're doing some cardio, you're going to get fitter. Now, if you've been doing some study, you'll hopefully learn something. And that's the sort of output. That's, that's where we want to be getting, getting those positive changes. And that's uh, using that, that uh, idea of bioplasticity that our body can always change and do these things. What happens though, is that when the recovery outlet is not optimal and it closes up and or the stress is in is just too much, then that water is going to come up and it's going to overflow over the damn wall. And that's when we get our protective responses. Pain being one of them, being the feeling protection but also the, the three musketeers and they sit underneath that and that's the motor system. So you're going to get muscle spasm, tension on that one, your immune system. So you might get some inflammation responses and your hormonal system. So you're going to get a fight flight, you know, cortisol, adrenaline type responses. And that's all about trying to protect you from damage, it's going to stop you. So if you start to notice those type of protective outputs, then you can look back and go, ha, ah, okay. Is my input, my stress, is, is that too much? Is my recovery not going as well? And then you can look back and try to reflect and go, okay, what do I need to do? And often it's a bit of both. We're doing too much and we're not mm. recovering too little. And the, the sad thing about that is that when the protective response is going, if the damn wall is overflowing, the wheel has stopped turning. The alarm mm. is being pushed. Nothing's, nothing's being powered and changed anymore. So that extra workout that you try and do when you're already cooked and you're trying to look after three kids and work's been crazy and you're like, I'm going to slam myself with workout. You just achieved nothing. All you did was increase the protective responses. There was no increase in strength, no increase in fitness in that. The body just didn't have the resources left. Yeah. And so I it like the analogy. It's so good. Yeah. Um, and I like it. Like it pulls it together, but it also pulls into like the biology behind it all mm -hmm. about what that is there for. But uh, it helps people to have that visual aspect about what that looks like, but then to work out, okay, you've got to then have enough margin in the reservoir, add more workout in, or to do like for, for me, adding your, re your, your rehab exercise. And if there's not enough margin, we've got to be able to try and find the margin to be able to get the exercises in so that you can build the capacity. Because with those exercises and things, hopefully you can build the damn wall higher and so then you mm. can fit more in. But usually what happens if people come in to see me, they've had an injury, something's gone on, that injury is taking half that damn wall out. And so something yeah. else not they used to be able to do, that's cooking them now. They aren't they're getting these protective responses. That's why they're in pain and their muscles are all stiff and sore and they can't move anymore. On the pain part, like I'm not, like that analogy is perfect in the sense of like what you said. Well, actually, we'll go with that first. Like 
when you, like I use the stress cover, we use the dam. Like when you work within the capacity of your dam, it gives you that chance to build a higher wall. So you can fit more of life. Like you saying that you fit more of life shit into it without the spillover. And then you've got a functioning turbine to flow all the stuff processes through that you need to do. But if you are, if you like, which is what I did when I had kids, I used training and stuff as a stress reliever and I put it in air quotes because it feels like you get what you need, which is that endorphin hit. But what I'm doing is just spilling over that damn wall and it wasn't getting any bigger. Like I wasn't getting any fitter. It felt like I was because I was doing work, but I wasn't getting better. I mean, this is a big concept that um, I feel dads struggle with a lot because we want to go. Once we get into something and we enjoy it, we will want to go pretty hard into that thing. And my, I'm kind of like controlling the dose of people. I hate, so they don't go so far, like it's just constantly spilling over their stress cup and then all damn and eventually causing a massive flood down the road. Yeah. Which is, flare up. yeah, which is, it's, it's kind of like pain can be like a laggy indicator, but sometimes it's probably the most acute one. Like it's like, well, it's a little bit faster, but all the other ones you mentioned, they're kind of like so laggy. It's almost like days, weeks, months down the road where it's going to hit you. And then you're like, oh, I've got to go back. What, what's really wrong? And stuff's been wrong for a while. Yeah. And, and that's the crazy thing because those, those three musketeers, they're actually happening all the time. Mm. We, we're unaware of them going on, but they are always protecting you. Pain is often the first conscious indicator that something is trained. Yeah. It's, it's not, not, not all right because it's, it's more, it's not necessarily tissue damage things and we can get into that. But um, it's that, that indication that your system believes you need protection. And that's the first conscious sort of session that one. But the other ones that, that motor system changes, the immune system changes, the hormonal system changes, they are all always going on that, in that big feed like loop, loop trying to keep you balanced. Um, but yeah, you, if, if you're starting to notice those things, then we know like, okay, yeah, they've never yeah. really rammed up to that point where now you are noticing it where, yeah, we're way, way beyond that point. On pain, what do you, what's kind of some common misconceptions on pain that you hear a lot of? And what, if you could, what would you like to, what kind of belief do you want to instill on people around pain mm. to get them in a better framework mindset around it? The biggest misconception of pain is that pain is damage. Mm. That if you've hurt something, if you've damaged something, you know, pulled a muscle, broken a bone, that is, pain is telling you about that. Um, but pain is actually an output of protection. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a judgment call of the threat the system feels upon. And so pain and damage don't always, in fact, actually rarely match up. Mm. Pain is not a good indicator of damage. You can have major, major damage, no pain. You can have major, major pain and no damage. Um, classic examples, if you've ever talked to a, uh, someone who's had been bitten by a shark, shark attack victim, yeah. they, they will tell you, there's no pain when you get bitten until you get down, until like you're in the hospital or you're on the beach and you know that you're not going to die because your system's like, okay, if you're going to die, it's like, I don't care about the leg. We need to get you out of here. So it's not telling you protect the leg. It's like protect you. Get me mm. to the beach. It's only when you get to the beach, you're like, okay, now you're not going to die. Now deal with the bleeding stump of a leg that we need to deal with. And that's when it gives you pain. So that's, that's the biggest thing. Because people often come in and go, oh, I've got pain. That means I've got damage, which means I need to stop. And then they avoid all pain. And then they go into yeah. the cycle. is because, okay, if you're not doing any activity, you get weaker. The system becomes more sensitive, so the pain gets worse, but you can't do more things, and it gets sort of this cycle. Whereas what we want to do is to understand, okay, pain is protection, which means you can be sore, but you're still safe, mm. which is a, a, a sort of a flip on that one. And there's differences of when you're getting pain. Because 
pain early on, pain with like what we call an acute injury. So if you've just torn your hamstring or rolled your ankle, pain at that point is still protecting. No, he's frozen. Hopefully he comes back in a minute. Hopefully it's not my side. Well, hopefully he comes back, but oh, it's he's promoting back. healing. I lost Stop. Jack. That's all right. Have you got the, where do we got an acute injury? Yeah. Start that sentence again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we have an acute injury, like a, a hamstring tear or a rolled yeah. ankle, pain at that point is protective and it promotes healing. It stops you doing too much while the tissues are still healing and getting better. Yeah. Right. However, if the normal sort of rehab journey is, you know, in the first couple of days, you have the inflammation, then you have the remodeling sort of phase, and then we need to start to load it up. You start walking on a more, you start doing your calf raises, you start strengthening up. And that process helps those tissues that are healing to get stronger again. And then the extra big buffer that we had with pain when we first did it, that will slowly get smaller and smaller as you get stronger and stronger, and then it gets back to that normal little small pain buffer. And that's a good thing. That helps us get helps that recovery. Now in about one in five people, one in four in regional areas, that pain, that big pain buffer that was helping you to heal, that doesn't decrease. That sticks around. I'm not really sure why yet. We've got some ideas, but that sticks around. And that will now becomes what we call that uh, persistent pain. So now pain is overprotecting and it's stopping you healing. Because it mm. won't let you do those exercises to strengthen up and get it loaded. Now, in that sense, that's where this idea that if you have the idea that pain is damaged and I'm making it worse, well, then you're going to avoid all that pain. Yeah. If you have the idea that pain is protection and that pain at this point, things are mostly healed or are getting better and pain now is overprotecting you, and then you have this really big buffer. It's like you've been wrapped in lots and lots of bubble wrap then we can start to push into that barrier and we're not going to make it worse. We're actually, that's what we need to do to make it better. Mm -hmm. Think of it, uh, we'll give you another analogy here. Think of it like you're uh, uh, at a, a bit of a look, lookout. I always use Hall Scout because it's just up the road here um, in the pinnacle lane. So you've got the cliff and the lookout there. And you can think of the cliff as the point where you would, if you go over the cliff, you cause tissue damage. Clearly, if you go up there, it's going to be bad. <laughs> and just before the cliff, there's that barrier. And the barrier that is there, that's that pain protect level. If you went past the barrier, someone's going to scream at you going, oh, that looks dangerous. Come back. Mm -hmm. So that's the pain thing. So pain, damage, two separate points. Generally, that barrier is nice and close to the, to the edge so you can see what's going on. Now, in the, the sense where we said before, where the pain buff becomes bigger, you've had an injury. The barrier becomes, gets pulled right back. Maybe because the cliff is unstable, there's been lots of rain, that sort of thing. And that's helpful at that point. But if as things go, the cliff dries up, things become stable again, the, the barrier is still way off the edge. So you're really safe back there, but you can't see the view anymore. You can't go and do those activities that you really enjoyed. So what we want to do is to slowly go up to the barrier, pick it up and nudge it and slowly move it forward again over time and get it back to the edge. Mm. So you don't want it. You've got, often have two different responses. You've got the people who avoid it. They go, pain is bad, pain is damaged. You don't want to do it. And so they never get there, but we never get to go view, see the view we get. Or you've got the, uh, the injuries. They're like, I've got stuff to do. Stuff this yes. pain. And they sprint towards the barrier and then flip over the top and then they get a massive flare up and they can't do anything for a day or two. And then mm. we repeat that cycle over and over and over again. And that doesn't get to recover either. So that's probably the message is that, okay, pain is uh, protective and helpful, but it can also become overprotective and unhelpful at that point. And the way that we get past that is to slowly chip away at it and slowly nudge into that pain and be okay with a little bit of discomfort, but not pushing too hard. And we can connect that back to what we were talking about in terms of the, the um, reservoir on the dam analogy. And it's all about that balance finding that sweet spot between pushing hard enough to get the, the adaptation we want, but not so hard that things flare up. 
And we can apply that to lots and lots of different things. Yeah. I like that. Cause it's kind of like the guy locally who I contracted to before completely super smart PT, like has gone around the world down and doing courses. And he had a concept of the moving bubble, which I think he got from, well, I'm blanking on where he got it from now, moving his medicine or something like that. But the, it's sort of a similar idea. Do the movements, whatever the movements are in the range of motion that feels good. And then over time, your bubble will expand. But if you constantly push yourself outside your bubble, the bubble will shrink. And we used to teach this in the class. So in a class setting, everyone would be doing push-ups. And some people clearly couldn't do a good quality push-up because of shoulder issues or technique or whatever. We're like, just the range that feels good. From outside perspective, if someone watches it on video, they'd be like, well, what the hell is that when you watch that? world record push-up video where the guy looks like he barely does anything. He's just like, eh. And from the outside looking at it, it's like, that's bad. But when the people we had coming through, we're all like some beat up individuals trying to get into a group coaching. And and one, it allowed us to train everybody, but two, that allowed them to do something where it didn't actually make anything worse. And on that, like, do you have like a scale thing you sort of tell people on like when they do stuff? Because it'd be good for people to know. Yes, they should go get, go see a BT or even hook up with you on Zoom. The go talk to someone about it. But what's got a, a scaling kind of thing with like where they can stand inside the new ball, do this exercise of a state bit in this. It's a good thing. If you did this exercise and went a bit outside this, like this range, probably not so good. Do anything kind of like that? Yeah. I generally tell people just, you know, nudge into the discomfort, but don't push through it. Mm. Uh, and then if people are like, uh, they're like, what does that look like? I'll then give them the rule of 10. And this is, this is a Ben Cormack. He's a physio out in the UK. It's his concept. But essentially the rule of 10 is you take the pain out of 10 that you're experiencing doing activity and the effort required to do that exercise or activity out of 10, 10 being the highest. Um, sort of like an RPE and we want them to add up to 10 or less. Mm. So if you're going for a walk and it's pretty flat, you're going pretty easy. It's five out of 10 uh, effort. And you know, if you've got knee pain, say you've got a three out of 10 pain, sweet, we're okay. But nudging to that, we're adding up to eight, we're okay. If you then went, turn around a corner and there's now this big heel, now it's like a seven out of eight effort and the pain's increased to a four or five out of 10. Now it's too much. We've got to bring it back. Mm. I like that. That's really cool. That'd be... So David Cormac, I'm just going to say you created it. We'll put it in build for adventure. Because it's like, that's such a cool sort of concept for someone doing shit for themselves. Mm. Score yourself out of 10, how your effort was, which at first will be hard. It's always yeah. hard, but you get used to it as you do it. Um, and then scoring yourself on the pain level, that's also... So it's not hard. They're, they're both totally subjective. Yeah, yeah. Let's make it hard. So, which is why I sort of go, well, you know, the nudge but don't push through concept is good for some people. They get that. Or yeah. if, particularly if they, they totally can't do the self-rating. And I've had patients like they can't rate their own pain or their own effort. It's just, they just yeah. can't do it. Um, but other people like, they're like, I want a number. I want to know exactly how hard. And that's when we go with that one. But yeah, it is totally subjective. So it's, it's going to be a little bit of a, a guide. Yeah call it a rule, but it's more like a guideline Yeah, um, yeah. to try and sort of help them through that. But yes, the, the hard part with effort is, and it's the same with the auto regulation stuff. If you really get into uh, the deeper, the weeds of that in the gym with, you know, reps and reserve and stuff, mm. you don't know what two reps left in reserve are until you know what zero reps left in reserve are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if you're talking in a rehab perspective and stuff or with the general population, not many people know what their max is. Yeah. And it's one of those things you don't want them to go there either. No, you can't go there at the moment. We, we, yeah. we can't push that rate. So a lot of times you'll be like, oh, what was that? I'm like, oh, that was an eight effort. And you'll put it up and you go, what was that? They're like, well, I probably could have gone more. So it's probably still an eight effort, but it was harder than the previous eight effort that I just gave you. Yeah. So that, yeah, it's, it's hard to work on that one, but it does give you a little bit of a rule of thumb about it, okay? How hard are you pushing? Are you redlining this or you know, trying to find that gray zone, that middle zone of pushing a little bit and being okay with a little bit of pain 
but knowing when pain's like, okay, now we actually do need to pull it back. And do you, stick with the pain theme, like, do you believe, believe, or the, the idea of the concept of like, they've had pain and it, the brain just keeps that pain signal there to stop them ever finding that, going into that movement or whatever it was that caused that pain again. Like psychologically, it just plants a seed to say, it's always there. You know, there's typically nothing there wrong anymore. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of our, um, we know that, um, we go back to our old way of thinking about pain mm. that, you know, damage meant pain. And that was like the, the, the old, um, Cartesian thing, you know, flame at the toe and that sent a message mm. up to your brain that says pain because it's damage. Well, we actually now know that that whole system is ridiculous. The concept pretty much Everything in your entire body, nervous system, hormonal system, immune system, everything influences your pain. Everything. Mm. There's not a single thing that doesn't influence your pain. And there's not a single thing that is not changeable. Everything has an ability to learn what we call bioplasticity. This is always changing. Um, change is inevitable. The direction of the change is not. Mm -hmm. So when someone has a painful experience or an adverse experience, your brain's going to remember that. There's going to be a memory there. And so the next time you do it, you are, it is going to influence uh, your pain experience. Um, Lorimer Mosley, who's my professor, who um, I did the postgrad stuff with, he does a really good TED talk on a bushwalk he did. Uh, going from his little campsite to Little Water and Holland, he's, wrong. he's walking along. And he feels something touch him on the outside of his ankle. And so he says, okay, the touch sensation goes through and gets you've been touched on the outside of the ankle. And then the brain goes, okay, where are they? What's the context here? We're looking around, huh? We're in the bush. We're going walking. Have we been here before? Yeah, we've been here before. It's probably just a stick. You're okay. We don't need to give you any protective pain. That's fine. What has actually happened, he's been bitten by a king brown snake. <laughs> Blacks out a couple of seconds later, his mates take him to hospital and things. He recovers, but, you know, fairly serious sort of incident. Yeah. A couple of months later, he's going bushwalking again, going from his campsite to go to the, to the, the watering hole, feels something touching him on the other side of the ankle. Message comes up again. You've been touched on the outside of the ankle. Brain goes, okay, have we been here for what, what's going on? Oh, well, we're in the bush. We're going bushwalking. Have we been here before? Yes. Last time we felt that here, you almost died. This is bad. 10 out of 10 pain. He's rolling around the ground been scratched by a stick so that previous experience that context radically changes the pain output because it changes that danger versus safety aspect and in my in my patients we've got you know, these persistent pain we can delve deeper into that and go okay what are all the things in your life that represent in you danger versus representing in you safety and if you can manipulate it so we have more safety and less danger, then you're less likely to get that pain response and pain experience. And that we sounds know like it'd be a lot of, like it's a lot of work, a lot of rewiring of patterns. A lot of rewiring, yeah. And we do know if we take someone through um, pain science neuroeducation, so we tell them all about this, this modern understanding of pain, um, and we can get a Deep conceptual change, and that's key. The deep conceptual change. So we've actually, they don't just know it here. They, they really, really know it and they've experienced it and they live it out. If we can get that over 12 months, we can get someone who's lived with pain for many, many years. We can get them to pretty much having no pain. Good. But it takes 12 months of that rewiring and it has to be a deep conceptual change. If they, they, they have the understanding like they can tell you this is what it is, but they don't really believe it. They don't really take it on. There's no change in that pain. It's kind of the connection with that to behavior change in general is pretty, pretty damn huge. Oh, I, I noted that to talk about yeah. that connection with the mindset stuff that you do, we do in, in yeah, yeah. Adventure. Cause I, I think it's the same. Yeah. Which is rewiring the. The stories, while in the mindset stuff, it's our past traumas, history, whatever that's creating these stories that make us act out in ways that 
aren't desirable, which give us outcomes that we don't really want. Hence like binge eating or whatever. And then that's my thing. My thing's food. Boredom, food. That's what I go to. And like must have been from when I was a kid, you're bored, eat them. Something like that must have been dragged forward with me. And then, yeah, just thinking about that with the pain thing, even though it's like, it's a legit story. You probably got something pretty traumatic happen to you in a pain sense. And just rewrote this story and the story keeps playing out every time you feel that pain again. And yeah, rewriting that story when it comes up is pretty huge. Because I, I know there's a lot of people in my family who have chronic pain, you could say that. In that sense, in pain, yeah, yeah, where it's just been for years, and they kind of probably couldn't even remember the last time they felt without pain, and it's that kind of stuff. When I thought about it, I was like, oh, why don't we just rewrite the story? Where like, yeah, the pain might never go away, but the whole like applying a different meaning to the thing. Like, what can we do? What's absolutely can we kind of get to, like, in the way you're talking about it? If you give it that twelve months and rewire. Yeah the patterns and all that kind of stuff. I'm not very scientific as you can tell. Rewire the, the patterns and everything to get a better story to come out. That's crazy, which is, I know it's kind of, only been kind of recent, this pain science kind of stuff. You know, recent, I mean, in the sense of like human lifespan, but it's like, I don't remember it being talked about as much 10 years ago, 15 years ago when I started doing personal but it's definitely been talked about a lot, a lot the last five years. Yeah, it's it's really come forward. Um, I was I remember being disappointed when I did my course because the references we were looking at was like 1990, and I'm like, yeah, and this stuff yeah. since then. Why are we still not getting it? Um, it's just yeah, it takes ages for the research to come out. Um, but yeah, I, I think I know there'll be people listening to this and going, oh, gee, you know, he's just talking about changing your thinking. You can change your pain. That, that, that's, that can't happen. That sounds really woo-woo. Um, and that's the response you get with when you talk about, you know, mindset and changing the story. Mm-hmm. Like, how can that possibly change any physical outputs and things? And it's only, it was this year going through teaching, because I was teaching this stuff to some physio students a few months ago. And I've really made that connection with that when we talk about the influence of thoughts and previous experiences and your deep held beliefs on this it's when we have the idea that there's a mind body dualism so the separate you have your mind and your body that feels woo woo (laughs) but that doesn't exist a thought a belief a memory is just a group of brain cells (laughs) that are influencing other brain cells that influence the brain cells that connect to all your other physiology. And if we expand that out, your nervous system cells are all modulated by immune cells. There's actually more immune cells in your brain than there are nervous system cells, which is why you have such a massive connection between your thoughts, beliefs, the positivity and your, your health outcomes. You know, why do you think people who have positive outlets may have much better health, be able to uh, endure sufferings much more if you have that positive out- outlet and that positive sort of outlook of things. So if we can change beliefs, we change the story, you are actually changing the brain chemistry, the structure of your biology, which then changes everything else physically. So if you can view it that way, it's like, it's not this psychological woo-woo thing out there. It's like, you are still making physical body changes the same as if you were doing bicep girls and getting bigger biceps, you're just doing bicep girls for your, for your nervous system and rewiring that and adapting that in a positive direction. Remembering that change is inevitable, but the direction of change is not. And we can let the change go negatively and just let it go wherever we want, or we can start to try and channel it and do something uh, purposeful to change it in the direction that we actually want it to change. <laughs> My job yeah. <laughs> on that one, because it's kind of, that's a good hit home thing for people in the sense of connecting the two together, which 
is a tough sell. I mean, I get it. Like we talk about, we talk about it all the time when we catch up. The tough sell of getting people to buy into the things that we do backwards and forwards every day. The daily wins we check in with each other on. And the daily journaling, which is the thing, like we struggle with it. We both shit at it. Oh, yeah. With each other. It's that stuff that rewire in the brain. Even though it's like on paper, it looks like nothing. But it's changing your, telling your brain to change the story, which it will fight tooth and nail to stop you from doing. And we talk about it all the time, like, <laughs> I, we, I do to you, when there's like the thoughts come up or something, where it's like, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, this is really going to work. We call it like that bound nature, free nature thing. We're like, that's just your bound nature. We're like, yep, damn it. And like, <laughs> Yeah, oh, Chris, no, no. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's so hard because I do it as well. And I'll be like, I'll say something to cats and I'm driving the kids to school and I was just driving along I'm like, oh, that was just my bad nature response there. And I would literally just pull over and spin her far off a text because she's like, I didn't really mean anything I just said. I didn't even know what I just said. It doesn't make sense. Just ignore that. <laughs> or whatever it was. It could be over nothing. Cat would be like, I don't even know what you're talking about. They're like, yeah, good. That's good. Fine. <laughs> Move it on. So well, we've got about like 10 more minutes. I reckon I'm going to get you back for another one. To yeah, talk about the other stuff we wanted to talk about. If you could wrap it up with a shiny bow on it. Pain. Do a monologue on pain. Like you kind of did a mic drop one anyway. Mm. But if you want anyone to take away some kind of belief away from today, what else would you want them to know? Well, we've gone through, we've gone through that, that pain being protective and mm. pain helping healing initially, but then hindering pain if it continues on. And we've talked about how everything can influence pain, including our thoughts, beliefs, past experiences, body systems, and that, that connection between the mind and body being, it's just being this one thing and the immune system, hormonal system nervous system all being this one big super system. So if you think about all that, the, probably the bigger takeaway is that even if you don't believe what I'm talking about, and often that's sometimes the case, mm -hmm. talking and, and learning about it, this, that's, 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 this is a high level stuff. Mm -hmm. When we talk about that deep conceptual shift that's required to get some of this happening, you need to experience it. It's got to be done. And that could be in that movement. And I think it comes back to what you were talking about before in terms of the flexibility of what you believe a workout and movement actually looks like. When you've got a idea of pain and damage, it's sort of an all or nothing. If I have pain, it means it's bad. If I have no pain, it means I'm good. When we start to talk about this sort of continuum of protection. And I want to try and make that shift too with workouts. So it's not all or nothing. It's not like, blast myself into the ground or I, it's not worth doing, which is, I think it's a very Western sort of style of workout. It is. Know? Yeah. If, if I don't, if I'm not in a puddle of sweat dying at the end of the workout, it wasn't, it wasn't a good workout. I didn't achieve anything, which is a lot of crap. Yeah. Um, and if you like, and I know you're, you're a fan, I'm you know, a fan of, um, Pavel Tatsuni and, and the Kettlebell mm. guys. And if you talk to like the Eastern philosophies that they don't have that. And, and I, it's probably a little bit of a luxury that we have here that we can run ourselves with the ground on a workout and then just go to the office and sit there. If you're a farmer or a, a physical uh, athlete or, you know, tactical athlete, or you have to use your body in any way um, or protect your family in any way or, or do anything like that in your everyday, you can't afford to be so sore you can't walk. And so this, that idea I think is, is just an, a cultural idea. So trying to shift back this, continuum and flexibility of what does physical activity, what does exercise look like? And that there is no good or bad. There's no, um, there's no, I guess there's, there's a better one, but there's only, what can you do now? And then mm. sort of take that next step. If you have done absolutely nothing for months because you've had this ongoing pain, what's the one thing that you can take a step closer to be a little bit more active? No, I, walking is a really good one. People are like, oh, I want to be able to walk again. And I'm like, don't start with walking the six kilometers around the lake here. 
you don't want to get halfway through and go, uh oh, I can't keep going. Mm-hmm. You want to the letterbox and back and do little loops there until you prove to yourself that, hey, yeah, I've just done a kilometer of little loops back and forth. Now I know I can do that 500 meter loop around there. Now I can do that. And so you want to collect the positive evidence of things with small little bits, safe bits. And as you collect that evidence, you prove to yourself that you are able to take the next step and do it. But you also prove to your system that that is safe and that you are capable of being able to handle that. And that process starts to calm down all those protective responses and things. So that change from that all or nothing principle to a continuum of effort and having the flexibility that any movement is good movement. Think motion is lotion, rest is rust. Yes. If you do that movement, then that's going to be good. Even if it feels like nothing, you're still just taking those one steps. And in a year from now, you're going to be way, way better if you said, no, I have to wait until I have no pain before I can do it. I like that. That's perfect. It's kind of like do something today that will make you come back better tomorrow. Absolutely. If you do that every day, you ask yourself that question every day, it just builds on itself. And that whole James Clear 1% incremental change every day, mm. you're in a totally different direction when you come to the fork of the road now, the negative to the positive or whatever we want to call it. 1% towards that direction on the good side. Oh. Yeah. I think of a better word, but where you want to be, the first you, whatever that is. Yeah. And then and I like, I really like what you said about like the little bits. Well, it's like always, which is hard to comprehend, but always leave room in the tank. Yeah. Training is not meant to be empty in the tank. Training is meant to, to build a bigger engine and all those kinds of things to make you better. So you should walk out better. Yes. Every now and then you're going to have these things that you do that will. You, a, a challenge. A challenge is meant to only happen technically two times a year. They really not like every day or every week. Yeah. So you sprinkle them in once you start building capacity for them, and your body Absolutely. will show you when you're ready for them. Sort of like um, it's like my spiel to tradies. You don't want work to be the workout. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. If you're redlining at work, it's only a matter of time before something breaks. You want to work out and exercise so that work is easy. Yeah. And you could do that all day. Yeah. Yeah. And that's things. The, the, yeah. The physicality of your job does not replace the training. Oh, that a lot. Anything else you want to wrap up with? Oh, wait, how can they, how can they find you? That's how can they find me? So I am, uh, I am on Facebook, but you won't be able to find me there because my, privacy settings are way too tight having been a teacher <laughs> i've already just found you on there yeah yeah you can not <laughs> find me on facebook uh you can find i am on instagram i think i'm on there i'm on linkedin it's probably a little bit easier to find me on that one otherwise you can go to if you google ballarat osm or ballarat orthopedic sports medicine uh you can find me on there uh, you can book in to see me in person uh, or on telehealth then you can do that one or you can call up um I don't know if my email is on there, but my email uh, is just simon.lewis at ballaratosm.com.au and I'll give that to Bruce. You can put it in the show notes and things. Yep, um, yep. Maybe I'll put a link to my socials too. That could be easier to find me rather than because you can't search for me there. So yeah, we'll put all we'll the, put the links up, up in there. At the end as well. And then I can, if you're, we'll see if you're free next week, we'll do another one because there was other, like, like three other topics we wanted to cover off. Yeah, we we didn't bit of a teaser. Anyway, yeah. 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 What the teaser for the other three topics we were thinking about? Um, well, we, we were going to delve a little bit deeper into those healthy habits mm-hmm. that we talked about in the damn uh, analogy there and the biology about how they actually help in and work with that. So we could delve a little bit deeper. I get that'd be a good one. Sure. That'd be a good um, one for itself. We'll do absolutely. three episodes. <laughs> yeah. Um, we haven't even started to delve on education and, and learning and the effects of that and how to do that effectively. Um, mm. And then my, my current little musing is because I do a lot of work in osteoporosis and bone density work. Um, and we haven't taught that either. But yeah, we've got heaps. I can, uh, we'll chat offline. We'll get another one, but we'll try and get a few more done and bring them out every two weeks so it spreads it out. This is cool. Keep going. Thanks, dude. Links in the show notes. I'll get better at putting them in there. If you haven't, 
checked it out. Any days listening, built for adventure. We've got the crew going. We've been going pretty strong. We've got 15 in there now. I think 15, 15 in there now, ready to go and come in. Simon's in there. We're all just literally doing the things we need to do to live the life we want to live. Physically, emotionally, all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested and want to know more, have a free guide about the Build for Adventure program. I can send it through you. Yeah, thanks for jumping on. I'll edit this all up. It'll we'll be out this week, actually. So it'll come out Thursday and I'll send you all the stuff. But yeah, thanks everybody. Talk to you later. That was awesome, dude. So that's going to load up in the back.